Of all the passages in which Jesus talks about being the bread of life, this, for me, is the hardest one. As a school chaplain, I spend my day surrounded by concrete, sequential people. Students' brains are wired for imagination, but they are also wired for literal interpretation. It's easy to imagine a rainbow unicorn leaping through the field, or aliens flying around space. But when the analogy is related to something that students have experienced, like eating, and someone says, eat my flesh, most students immediately think, no way. I am not going to take a bite of you. That is gross. And I agree, it's gross. My guess is that that's what the folks who were listening to Jesus at that time thought too. Sure, he's used all kinds of language about being the bread, but it was always esoteric enough to be safe. And when he fed them, he always fed them with real normal food. He's never talked about the bread of life as concretely as he has this day, eating his very flesh and drinking his very blood. What do we do with that? First, we don't allow ourselves to get stuck there. We take our brains from the very literal and we open some windows so that we can have a broader understanding. It is true that Jesus wants us to consume him. The way we consume our favorite coffee, our favorite steak, our favorite dessert, time with our best friend, a stunning sunset, music that moves our souls, or a book that we just can't put down. You get the point. Jesus wants us to wholly, fully get lost in him. He wants us to savor his goodness. He wants us to find comfort in him, just as we do with all those other things that I named. Jesus wants us to take him in. He wants to become a part of our lives, just as food becomes a part of our body, fueling us to think and feel and do. And Jesus knows that the only way we can know true life is if we devour him. But I understand why so many people left. I might have, honestly. What Jesus is asking is difficult. Now they loved his healings. They loved his winemaking. They loved his food multiplying. They loved the ways he subverted the authority under which they lived. They loved his concern for people. What they didn't understand was that all of those things come with caveat. When Jesus gets to the point in explaining this caveat, they can't grasp it. The son of man ascending to where he was before. They're thinking, eat his flesh, now watch him float away. This is crazy talk. Even though they are benefactors of his miracles, they can't open the windows of their brains enough to imagine this inexplicable claim. Nor could they see through it to accept with faith, and that's the caveat, who Jesus really was. I get it. I really do get it. Just, there are times, y'all, that it's hard to have faith. It's just hard. I'm not ready to cast any stones at them. Don't we all have times when loneliness or fear fill us? Don't we all have times when we're desperately looking, looking around us for answers, for a path on which to walk? 
That is why Jesus says we must consume him. We have to fill the tiny corners of our hearts and souls that are the very darkest places with this all-embracing, healing, life-giving love. And if we do that, if we take Jesus in, if we savor Jesus' love, the ways we take in and savor all those other things, when the dark night of the soul comes, and it always comes, there will be a flicker of light to shatter the darkness. So it all sounds good, right? How do we do it? Well, we become intentional in our prayers. We don't skip them when we're late or when we're tired or when we're angry. We don't say them in some perfunctory way out of superstition that if we don't say them, something bad is going to happen to us. Instead, we think about the words we say being brutally honest when we pray, expressing our fears and our failures, our anger, our thanksgiving, our joys, our needs, our praise. Five sincere words in a prayer mean so much more than 50 said just to say them. Another thing we can do is become intentional in our devotion time. Whether it's an online five-minute devotion, a podcast, a Bible study, or a book we're reading, we should immerse ourselves into it, block out all of the distractions that can rob our attention. Because when we are immersed, that is when God can speak to us. And another thing we could do is to come to this table with intention. Walk up that center aisle, noticing the solid ground under your feet. Notice the people you pass with each step. Notice the beauty of the music that is offered in gratitude. And then when you arrive at the table, choose. Make a conscious choice to open your hands to receive the body of Christ. We purposefully pause to acknowledge that simple bread that is about to be handed to us is at the same time the most perfectly powerful gift of love that can fill us as nothing else can. And we don't need to be in a hurry to leave the table. I fear that we often rush our time at this sacred juncture because we don't want to slow others down. There's a line of people behind us. There's a child that's chattering. We don't want to stay too long because then we'll appear too pious or we'll, we'll appear too needy or we'll appear some whatever. My friends, when we come to this table, it is not a moment to rush. It is a moment to savor. It is not a meal to eat out of duty, but one to cherish. It is the opportunity to let down our guard and be more vulnerable than we can be at any other time in the week. At this table, in this meal, our creator who knows us best is here. Our redeemer fills us with love and mercy. Our sustainer covers us with grace. This meal is what feel, fills our hearts and souls with unquenchable light. This meal, it's the path. A story is told about a missionary that got lost in the African jungle there's some clear patches, but there's a lot of bush. He finally happens upon a native, and he says to that native, out, can you get me out? And the native grabs his stick and his blade and said, walk. They walked, and they hacked their way through the unmarked jungle for more than an hour when the missionary could not stand it any longer. And he looked at the native, and he said, are you quite sure this is the way? 
Like, where is the path? And the native responded, Juana, in their place, there is no path. There is no path. I am the path. When Jesus asked the same question to those who remained, when Jesus is asked, Jesus asked the question, are they leaving? When others asked Jesus, are you sure this is the way? Jesus responds, every time, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the path. I am the bread of life. Become one with me, and you will surely know the way. The way is love. Always love. Amen.